welcome to All Things Green. I'm Anton, here with my co-host Shelby to discuss a variety of topics from across the sustainability universe. Shelby, how are you today? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm doing okay. I, I, I got a flat tire yesterday on the way back from Trivia. Oh, no. Yeah, on my e-bike, yeah. Oh, you love your e-bike. I love my e-bike. It's not ruined, though. I assume it's not. Kind of I just have to get it fixed. But So how'd you get here today? I took my acoustic bike, <laughs> my analog bike, my regular bike, yeah. Okay, and how was that in comparison to the e-bike? How was the um, trip here? I always feel like a little bit of a wuss after, like, I've been e-biking for, like, consecutive weeks, and then I go back to my regular bike, I'm like, <gasps> <gasps> especially with the air quality in Cleveland right now. Oh, yeah, because we're bad. getting all those wildfires. Well, we're not getting the wildfires, but we're getting the air from the wildfires in Canada. Yeah, Canada. Our yeah. neighbors to the north. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you had to take your acoustic bike, and yeah. uh, it's because you are you had a flat tire in the e-bike. Yeah, exactly. It's a but, rough day. You know, thankfully, today we're going to maybe be talking about some solutions for how to not get a flat tire. Do you mean, like, filling up your tires with air more often, or? But no, it wasn't It wasn't flat. I think I ran over a piece of glass. Oh, okay, okay I pumped okay, my okay. tires up like two days before. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. What's, okay, what's the solution then? What's the magic solution? Well, we're gonna be talking a little bit about science and tech today, and so I brought, um, I've brought to the table airless tires. Airless? Yeah, airless. Have you heard of airless tires at no. all? No, but listen, I'm gonna be honest, I don't spend that much time with tires, so. Yeah, okay. I haven't really, <laughs> I guess it, it didn't even occur to me to innovate there. It just seemed like they were kind of doing the job, but maybe that's because I don't have a bike, and so I don't have to deal with filling up my tires. Yeah. only time I fill up my tires is when it gets really cold out and that pressure goes down. But, yeah, right. what's an airless tire? So an airless tire, uh, Akron, Be Akron Beacon Journal reports, and now for those who don't know about Akron, Akron is like the rubber capital of the world, mm -hmm. right, here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, they rolled out an article, Akron Beacon Journal, and they talked about some of the technology that Goodyear is working on, a tire company. They're working on the airless tire. It's supposed to be more sustainable, created with soybeans and silica derived from rice husk ash. That's supposed to give the tire more grip. Okay. Uh, it's supposed to be also, it's supposed to use those materials that are not really oil and gas, but more natural materials. Uh, it's also supposed to be less emissions during the production process. All of this sounds like great news. It sounds it sounds good. Um, uh oh, you did that thing where I said something sounds great <laughs> and you say, well It sounds it sounds okay. Okay, on, what's the downside? The Tell me what the downside is. Well, there's there's not a whole lot of downside in the production side of things other than maybe the soybean oil kind of makes me a little nervous mm -hmm. like we know in brazil they're like cutting down rainforest to plant soybeans and stuff yeah yeah so i mean that makes me a little nervous uh but really the the drawback is in the practice of using airless tires mm -hmm. uh, i talked to my uncle frank who actually owns a, a car shop in broadview heights nice frank's nice. coach and carriage if anybody's interested in getting their car fixed <laughs> uh Uncle Frank, when I was like, hey, Uncle Frank, what do you think about airless tires? He's like, they're no good. They don't work very well. <laughs> yeah, it was really funny. Uh, I was like, why don't they work very well? He's like, ruins your suspension. With e with EVs getting heavier, 8,000-pound car is going to eat through those tires. Oh, yeah. man, your uncle sounds like a really smart guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. Th that voice is very telling that he's a smart man. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> if somebody couldn't understand what I was saying with the Uncle Frank voice, the... Uh, Tires, the airless tires, they put a lot more wear on suspension for cars. So why maybe... Is, why is that? Like, what's happening with the tires? It's kind of like a double-edged sword. There's less bounce when you don't have air in the tire. Mm. So that means more energy can go forward on the road. Mm. But you're not... You're, you're kind of putting more stress on the suspension. Got it. So yeah. with heavier vehicles, like, you're going to have kind of like a double dose of, like, pain on the suspension. Like, Got it's, it. it's taking a lot of weight. Um... But on smaller vehicles, or even on like tractors and stuff, that don't have to deal with road noise, that that might be a legitimate solution. Yeah. I, I think also like it would be a really cool way to like, when's when's the last time you've like taken out your bike for the winter and like your tires are flat, and like that's kind of like oh I'm gonna have to pump up the tires or like mm -hmm. maybe they're flat I have to change the inner tube. I think like having airless tires would be like kind of a removing a barrier from like people not wanting to get their bike fixed up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it's one less barrier for me, the 
new biker who doesn't actually have a bike yet, it sounds like one <laughs> less thing for me to have to worry about is like also getting a bike pump and figuring out how all that works. Yeah. You as a cyclist are probably looking at me like, what do you mean figuring out how it works? <laughs> you just do it. But, <laughs> you know, all of this is a barrier to entry for me. So yeah. Well, I like that. That's exactly what I'm saying. And aside from, uh, aside from biking stuff, it might – airless tires, once they kind of get – more figured out the technology gets there uh we're also looking at a lot less like stoppages on the roads with like flat tires Mm -hmm. we're looking at less use of air compressors and stuff so there's also going to be like additional savings um, of emissions that way so okay this sounds good so you know no good deed goes unpunished we're trying to make electric vehicles happen and they're really heavy and so now it like gets in the way of the innovation and the tires but we had a lot of smart people working on things like this so just because that's where it is now doesn't mean that's what it'll be in the future yeah who knows in a few years we might be using airless tires on our cars Uh, i would personally really love to see airless tires on my bike yeah that's something that gets me excited um so i never have to do the the flat tire thing again you know walking it to a bus and then getting home that way well you should ask your uncle uncle how he feels about doing airless tires just on a bike and see if he thinks they're (laughs) they're good Maybe they're good. I don't know. <laughs> well, we talked a lot about air. Yeah. Uh, can I shift us into a different airspace? Airspace, yes. Yeah. Well, you talked about <laughs> airless tires. Yeah. And you also talked about driving, or not driving, cycling Riding, here. Yeah. Um, and how you had to deal with inhaling all the particulate matter because we're having these wildfires. Um So I kind of wanted to talk about air quality, if that sounds good. Yeah, let's talk about air quality. Absolutely. So air pollution is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. We know this. Um, It was a problem way before we started seeing the direct impact of the wildfires. That's making things a lot worse. But Cleveland, where we live, has pretty terrible air quality, really not our strong suit. Um, And the air quality, when you look at where it is in the city, where the poorest air quality is, it's exactly where you would expect. It's in the historically black and low-income neighborhoods. Right. Because we've zoned those places to be close to... Industry uh, and exactly. stuff like that. So all the neighborhoods that you might expect, basically, that kind of like central, the east side of proper Cleveland. Um, although also kind of on the near west side. So I'm trying not to be too specific for any non-Cleveland listeners. So there are even some up-and-coming neighborhoods that are really you know, cool and expensive <laughs> uh, that still deal with this just because of where they are geographically. Uh, and it's not good. We don't want to have too much particulate matter in our air. It's not healthy for us. Um, on days where we have really poor air quality, Someone like you or me might be able to go outside and not even notice it, even if long-term it's not good for us. But people who have more vulnerability, the people who are older or already have some kind of respiratory uh, dysfunction, it can be really difficult to go outside and breathe that air. Yeah. So what do we do about that? Ultimately, we need to monitor it because the more we can build up an evidence base, the more we can also build up arguments to help push for cleaner air. Sound right? Yeah, I, I think that's really important in dialoguing with our elected officials and stuff. Yeah, you talked a while ago about the Smell My City app. Do you yes. want to remind us about that yes. quickly? Yeah, so the Smell My City app, that's like a free app you download on your phone. And it asks you like three questions. It's like, what are you smelling? And you're like, rotten eggs, if it's like something sulfury or like uh, nail polish, if it smells like nail polish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that data is then crowdsourced into Carnegie Mellon's database. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about a new kind of technology that reminded me a lot of the collaborative effort from something like Smell My City. So this technology is out of MIT, and it's called Flatburn. And it is a pretty affordable portable air quality monitor. Okay. So it can either be 3D printed, if you have access to a 3D printer. You don't have to own a 3D printer. A lot of libraries will have this in their maker spaces. Um, But even if you don't have access to that, they can also ship you the parts uh, that are relatively affordable compared to going out and buying your own air quality monitor. And they'll give you instructions on how to put it together. Um, Because purchasing an air quality monitor can be like the low end, maybe $40, up to hundreds of dollars. Um, So this is supposed to be more affordable uh, for the everyday person to have access to monitoring their air quality. 
it's also solar powered, so it's able to oh, that's cool. yeah, be green in that way too. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a really cool idea, similar to Smell My City in that it's trying to crowdsource options for people to collect data about air quality and also have affordable ways to track that data. But there are a couple of cons here too. The big one being that A, it's not very well distributed right now, and B, that it doesn't feel super targeted for you and me. It feels a little more targeted for someone with a higher sort of data fluency. Uh, maybe I should only speak for myself. It, it looked too complicated for me. It's not, it's not really accessible information to just any regular Joe off the street. <laughs> exactly. Smell My City is just an app. Uh, if you have a smartphone, you can input the data, and you don't really have to know anything about coding or what the data you're inputting should look like or be formatted, whereas Flatburn, at least right now, is not out on the market in a way that it's been made super easy to understand and access. Yeah. So you could do the process of 3D printing it or acquiring the parts and putting it together. Uh, but unless you know how to kind of parse through data, you can go to their website and see what I'm talking about. You mm -hmm. need to go into things like GitHub to yeah. be able to download education materials. And it looked a little challenging. That said, I'm excited about the fact that it's out there and hopefully as more people are able to use it, it ends up uh, coming more to market for the average person so more of us are able to understand our own air quality in in the spaces that we live in yeah 100 percent. like those cheaper air monitors like the ones that you're talking about it's really cool because it's accessible from maybe like a price standpoint uh, something like the purple air monitor which is like a really expensive one but more accessible like you're paying hundreds of dollars more than you would for you know the what is it the flat burn flat burn flat yeah burn. Yeah. And then just out of curiosity, you just mentioned the purple air monitor. Do you know anyone who's using that? Or maybe the better question is, if people are using that, what do they do once they see data that say, okay, the air's not good today? Yeah. So that's like a really high quality air monitor. They cost like 230 bucks or something before tax, getting one brand new from their website. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what they do with it is they really just put it on the side of their house. Uh, I have a friend in Ashtabula, Julie, who is currently using her purple air monitor. And uh, that's that's a really easy way to just get really reliable results and take it right to your council person or township trustee or something like that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that last part about sort of what do you do with it once you've collected the data. Because yeah. when I was researching this technology, I was getting excited that it exists. And then I thought to myself, well, what would I do if I found out that the air wasn't good around me? Because if it's indoor air quality, there are some things that you can do. Maybe that's an issue with mold or, you know, asbestos, whatever. There could be issues with yeah. things in your home that an air quality professional could come out and address. But if it's on the side of your house and it's just telling you day in and day out, air quality is not good here. What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. So there are a few things we can do in sort of extreme situations like we're experiencing now with the particulate matter from the wildfires. You can actually wear the same kinds of N95 masks that you were wearing during COVID. Mm. That particulate size of the particulate matter is pretty similar to that tiny, tiny size of COVID. Uh, and so those masks work really well for that. So if you are particularly vulnerable or you just don't want to deal with getting it in your lungs, that's an option. But it doesn't feel like a good option for our day-to-day -day sort of non-emergency option. So I love what you said, which is just thank you. collect the data so you can share it with your council yeah. person. Share with your neighbors. Yes. Share with the people on your street. They, they're they suffering from the same air quality that you are, you know? Exactly. So we'll keep doing research on how particulate matter affects people, trying to spread that message. And if you happen to have access to something like Flatburn or Purple or any other way to monitor the air quality in your area, collect that data so that we can all uh, advocate for better air. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah. You want to tell us all about uh, something that's exciting for you? Trains. <laughs> Trains are pretty good. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've got your uh, RTA jacket on today. I do. Tell us about what RTA is. Regional Transit Authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, here it's the GC RTA, Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. 
and they do buses, they do rails, trains, stuff like that. So I'm a, I'm a frequent rider of the Red Line, which is like our east to west train. Mm -hmm. um, the West Park Station is like literally a 20 minute walk from my house. It's like a three minute bike ride because it's all downhill. Nice. Uh, <laughs> even on your acoustic bike? Even on my acoustic <laughs> bike. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about trains um, from a sustainability perspective. CNN reported that France just signed into law in late May the banning of short domestic flights. And this mm -hmm. is going to be diverting people to taking trains instead. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Those short flights, I mean, by the time you pack everything into plane appropriate sizes and then go wait at the airport and then your plane is delayed and then you take the flight. I don't even think it's faster. Right. And also we know that planes are not as sustainable either. Uh, all of the uh, total global emissions that come from planes is 3%. So 3%, honestly, if you were to cut down planes, then you're at 3% less, less global emissions. I mean, hey, 3% makes a difference. According to the International Energy Agency, trains are one of the most efficient modes of transportation. They use 80% less energy than trucks when carrying uh, a ton of weight. A ton okay. meaning 2,000 pounds. Thank you for clarifying, yeah. because honestly, when I hear a ton, I just think a lot, but I don't really know what that means. Right. Quickly, why is a train more environmentally friendly? Like, why is it producing fewer emissions? Trains are producing fewer emissions because of the fuel that they use. Mm -hmm. So there's like electric trains, there's diesel electric trains, there's still some steam powered engines out there. Mm -hmm. uh, using these kinds of uh, fuels are going to be less harmful to the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, the type of measurement that they use when comparing emissions is called emissions intensity. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding, that's just like comparing in apples and oranges. Like you're measuring car emissions versus like airplane emissions versus train emissions, then you talk about emissions intensity because they don't all take gasoline. You exactly. Know? I imagine it's also, and this, when I say imagine, I really mean this, maybe more efficient because it's sort of traveling along this predetermined route. There's less stopping and starting. Like we know that we get better gas mileage when you drive on the highway, right. which is probably what trains are experiencing because they get to just go straight through yeah. compared to the stop and go of cars and trucks on the road. Yeah, that's 100% right. So even from like a shipping perspective, right, we talked about the, f the freight weight, you know, it's more efficient to ship stuff, but also just transferring people to and fro, it's going to be a lot more sustainable than just taking your car or taking your airplane. A yeah. lot, lot less emission intensity. So you take local trains. Do you have any other experiences with maybe more long haul train rides? Yeah, so I've, I've done a couple Amtraks, uh, mostly... Cleveland to D.C. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that, I think that's the only one that I've taken. Cleveland to D.C. Yeah. And um, honestly, in America, we could really be pulling our weight a little bit more when it comes to public transportation. Yes. Um, I've seen train systems work in other countries. Like I went to Berlin, Germany, mm -hmm. and their S-Bahn, which is like their local transit. I mean, just amazing. Like they, every two minutes on the dot, you're going to see your subway come. Totally. The Amtrak, it's always like delayed and, and granted Amtrak is interstate travel. True. It's always delayed. It's it's really, really slow, like maybe like fourteen hours from Cleveland to DC or something. That's a long ride. Yeah. I uh, also have some international train experience that feels similar to yours. I lived in South Korea for a while and man, if a train was two minutes late, it was up in arms. Yeah. What is happening to this world? But they were so efficient and I loved taking the train. I lived about an hour, 15 minutes outside of Seoul by train. So I took it all the time and it was just easy and you didn't have to be behind the wheel of a car thinking about, well, what's the next move I need to make or is that car ahead of me about to stop like you just got to kind of sit back and listen to your podcast your favorite all things green podcast yeah. <laughs> and kill some time which I loved yeah I, I think that's a great perk of trains like just that slow transit sometimes slow transit yeah uh just really nice to be able to not have to worry about driving or or anything like that totally. the hubbub of going through the airport um but I just wanted to also just finish and always plug the pedestrians and cyclists trains are much more friendly to pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, oftentimes, you're dropped off in locations that are 
uh, like economic hubs or nodes when you're taking public transportation. Mm -hmm. So for me as a cyclist, um, I'll ride my bike down to the station. I'll hop on the train really easily with my bike and then it'll take me somewhere and I'll just hop off and bike, you know, 10 minutes to my destination. So I love that about trains. Yeah, I like that too. And, you know, you are a cyclist, so you're kind of accounting for the time that it takes to get to the train and the time it takes to get to your destination afterwards. For some people that might feel like a barrier. Okay, well, yeah, I can get on this public transit, but how do I get there? Uh, we often call this the final mile problem. Yeah. Essentially that you're going as close as you can get to your final destination and you might still have a mile's worth to get to where you need to go. So for someone like you, you could cycle, I might choose to walk, um, but not everybody can do that. And so just know that there are a lot of cities that are working on those last yeah. last mile, final mile problems with other solutions. Um, it's not all perfect yet, but the more we can lean into that kind of solution, the more we can also disinvest from fossil fuels and yeah, 100%. Uh, yeah, the car industry. Well, not to mention, like, it's kind of a pain in the butt to park sometimes. Yes. Especially you're, like, out, like, 10 or 15 bucks sometimes mm -hmm. in the city of Cleveland. Uh, it's much cheaper to park a bike. Absolutely. You just kind of chain it to a pole or something. <laughs> yeah, and just hope it's there when you get back. <laughs> yeah. So that's all things trains today. All things trains. <laughs> uh, I guess I should let everybody know how they can keep up to train with us. Yeah, please. <laughs> If you'd like to stay connected to us, be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at One Planet Media. That's O N E 1. And if you'd like to rewatch full episodes, check out our YouTube channel, All Things Green Show. You can find all of our sources from today's episodes in our show notes. We'll be back the same time next week to bring you more news. Thank you so much for being a part of the global sustainability movement.